Hello? Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the W.L. Mellon Speaker of Series, Sujin Nurit Shah, as our guest of the 2023 uh, 24 season. Please take your seat and settle in for the talk. I'm Advika Jayanti, representing the Undergraduate Entrepreneurship Association, and we're proud to be co hosting along with the Business and Technology Group, CMU AI Club, Business and uh, Carnegie Mellon's Business Association, and the Shore Center for Entrepreneurship. It's wonderful to see so many fellow CMU students here to learn from our guest about his entrepreneurship experience, industry insights, and key leadership lessons. What an honor to hear directly from such a global executive. Please take a moment now to prepare for the discussion. We kindly ask that you store cell phones away, stash your laptops, and put away any food. Uh, you will receive your ticket for lunch on the way out of the room for this afternoon. And now to formally introduce our speaker, I'm pleased to welcome to the podium Willem Van Hoff, uh, Carnegie Bosch Professor of Operations Research and the Senior Associate Dean of Education at the Tepper School of Business. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you, Advika, for uh, your introduction. And let me also echo your welcome to everyone in attendance today, in person. We have a big room here, great, and also online. Uh, Nira Shah is CEO, co-founder, and co-chairman of Wayfair, as you know. He co-founded the company with Steve Conine in 2002, and the pair rapidly grew the business to become one of the world's largest destinations for home furnishings, housewares, and home improvement goods. Before founding Wayfair, Niraj served as CEO and co-founder of Simplify Mobile, an enterprise software company which was sold in 2001. Prior to that, he served as entrepreneur in residence at Greylock Partners, as COO and a member of the board of IXL, and as CEO and co-founder of Spinners, which was sold to IXL in 1998. Niraj has been included in Fortune Magazine's 40 Under 40 list and has won the Ernst & Young's Entrepreneur of the Year Award. He also serves on the board of Massachusetts Competitive Partnership and the Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce. Niraj graduated from Cornell University with a, a Bachelor of Science in Engineering. We're very happy that he's here today to speak to us. And leading us through what I'm sure will be a thought-provoking conversation is today's moderator, Professor Dave Mowinney. In addition to being a full teaching professor at the Tepper School of Business, Dave is the founding executive director of the university's Swartz Center for Entrepreneurship. And he's also the executive director of the Tepper School's Donald H. Jones Center for Entrepreneurship. He is an experienced entrepreneur himself and continues to play an active role in Pittsburgh's entrepreneurial network as an advisor, board member, and mentor. We're all looking forward to a vibrant discussion. Dave, take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much, Willem, and thank you, Advika. really appreciate that. And welcome, everybody, today. Uh, Really excited to have Niraj uh, speak in our WL Mellon speaker series. This is a really an opportunity for our students to interact with senior executives and sort of learn how the sausage is made. But before we get started, I have to say it. Wayfair, you've got what I need. <laughs> uh, but now that I have the CEO and founder here, I've got to, I got to ask the question. I said, some of the things that you have are really pricey. They can cost an arm and a leg, and I can only afford half. <laughs> I got a lot of bad jokes out there. <laughs> I need a robotic arm, Bill. Can you help me out? So um, let's get started at the beginning, right? Um, how did you get into the furniture retail business? Yeah, so well, first of all, thank you for having me here. It's great to be here, and uh, nice to see such a big crowd. So thanks for, uh, thanks for coming. Um, but to, how did we get into the business? So. Actually, so when we were at Cornell, Steve Conan and I, who are the two co-founders of Wayfair, we were friends at Cornell. We were both engineering students. We um, were randomly three doors apart on our freshman year dorm, which is uh, how we and a group of folks became good friends. Um, and we ended up starting our first startup kind of through happenstance um, as seniors at Cornell. And that was, it was in 1995, it was the early days of the internet. We got involved with the internet in the early days. In, in the first business, we were building applications for other companies, it was, a, it was an IT consulting business. But long story short, seven years later, when we were trying to figure out what we wanted to do for what would be our third startup, um, we were basically thinking about different ideas, different, you know, we were trying to come up with something that took advantage of the skills we had. We didn't really have the specific idea. So one of the things we did is we, we basically looked around at 
what businesses were out there that folks were trying to sell, thinking maybe there's a kernel of something we could buy and we could grow. And there were, in 2002, a lot of small e-commerce companies that were growing 30 40% a year, um, and they were just outpacing what the, the one person or the two people who were running it w- could do, what they wanted to do. They didn't want to hire people. They didn't want to grow it. And it didn't make a lot of sense to us because uh, after the dot-com crash in 2000, you, you wouldn't have thought that the, you know that the headlines were that e-commerce hadn't worked out, wouldn't make sense, there weren't there wouldn't be these companies out there. So that caused us to, to poke around. What we realized is that e-commerce was growing, was doing well, but we had to pick a spot that was not already well covered. You know, and, and Amazon by that point was already eight years old, and you know Walmart and you know Home Depot and you know all these folks, Best Buy had already gotten their act together. They had websites. They were doing they were doing a good job. So. We basically looked for niche categories. Our first one was TV stands and speaker stands. And we, without um, realizing it would, that's started us down a 30-year track on uh, home goods. That's great. Start with a small segment. Not all of furniture, but a TV stand. I teach my students that all the time. Um, what were the biggest challenges in growing Wayfair? And, and from that sort of, what advice do you have for the student entrepreneurs and the audience? You know, I, I don't know that... I would say there's like one challenge that is when you look back on the kind of uh, you know from 2002 to now, right? So 22 years. I don't. I wouldn't say there's like one challenge that's the dominant theme through all of it. It's there's always just different challenges, and then frankly, there's some times where it's just you know things aren't going that well, and so you got to just you know what what are the key things we need to do? We need to grind through it. We're pretty sure these are gonna get us back on track. And then there are other times where things are going incredibly well, and you need to make sure you don't get complacent and take it for granted because, you know, sure enough, your competitors are out there working on new great ideas, and they're moving forward. And um, certainly, if, if you don't worry about that, you know, someone's going to do something better for those customers than you are, and, and, and they'll, they'll earn those customers' business. So I, I think it's just a matter of being in tune with where you are, with what your customers need, and then making sure you're prioritizing the right things and going after them with ambition, and sometimes that's getting through a rough patch, and sometimes that's even while things are going great. Right. Now, there's high highs and low lows, and you as the entrepreneur have to sort of even it out, but the focus on the customer is really important there. Can you tell us a little bit more about how you were focused on the customers early on and what dividends that paid as time went on? Yeah, so, you know, in our business, right, you can say it's a really simple business because retail's been around a really long time, right, because we don't really make anything. So we're, we're buying things from suppliers at wholesale and we're selling it to customers at retail. So you say in that sense, there's, there's nothing new to it. So how does a new retailer make their mark? Well, you have to do something for the customer that's better than what they could get before. For us, the big focus early on was how do we offer great selection while still offering great customer service without really demanding a price premium, so at a competitive price. So at that same competitive price, you would get better selection and you get better service. Now, over time, we've added a lot of finesse to that, and there's a lot more complexity in what we can do, and you know, whether that be better quality merchandising or whether that come into some of the things we can do in delivery and logistics. But the idea is like you always need to be worried about being great at what you do and being better so that the customer, who's going to be pretty savvy, makes a decision between you and your competitors and picks you because you've earned their business. And so we always say, like, you know, if you follow the flow of money, you know, if, if you want someone's money, you need to be, there needs to be a reason they want to give it to you. And the, the easiest way to think about that is think about where you've spent money in the last one week. Think about the things you bought. And why did you buy those things from whoever you bought them from? And why not go somewhere else? And there's going to be answers to that. You love that brand or that, that was convenient in a way that you didn't have much time or... You know, that was a, the, the, you really loved the thing and that, that price made it attractive or you'd saved up for that thing and it, it was the thing that was kind of the most important thing to you to buy this year or whatever, you know. And it's that same thing, just thinking backwards. Yeah, interesting. Well, competition defines strategy. So what's your strategy to keep Amazon out of your category or at least behind you in that category? And the same for Home Depot or Lowe's or Macy's for that matter. Yeah, so... The way we tend to think about it is we, we tend to say you, you really want to watch your competition and watch everyone out there. In fact, you want to watch people who might be great at the segment you're in in countries you don't operate in because maybe they're doing something novel. You want to be aware of what's going on. But we always say that actually don't obsess over your competition as much as you need to obsess over your customer. 
Because customers, you know, if you think about it from a customer standpoint, what are the frictions they're encountering or the difficulties they're having or what problems are they telling you that they have? Those are the things that are the most important things to solve. Now, you do need to prioritize them and not everything is equal. But um, just because your competitor is doing something, it may or may not mean that that thing is worth doing. Um, but if there's something that's the number one customer pain spot, th that is really important to fix. So we, we kind of encourage everyone on our team to be very aware of everything that's happening out there, but to make sure that they're really keenly aware of the customer's frictions and pain spots and desires. Right. Because in there will we'll come out what should be the priorities for us. Great advice. You know, maniacally delighted customers is what's important. So 22 years, wow. I mean, that's a long time. You've built this amazing brand. How has your leadership philosophy evolved over the years of going from startup to multinational company? See, I thought you were going to ask why I look so young. But I'm um, yeah, okay, so. That was, go, that was my next question. We, we can go with your question, though. We can go with your good question. Segue, good um, segue. You know, what I would say is, um, you know, over time, you know, what the, C, the job of the CEO as we've grown has changed. Mm -hmm. And so at each juncture, I think it's important to figure out, well, what, 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 what does that job need to be? What's going to allow the company to grow? And then there could be an element of, like, if that's something that I either don't think I'd be good at or be, don't, don't want to do, won't enjoy, then, you know, an, a, a fine option would also be to say that, hey, it's, it's not the right time for me to stay a CEO. You know, maybe I should, you know, just be a board member or maybe I should, you know, what, what, whatever it would be. Um, so for me, what I have continued to enjoy the journey, and the fact that it's evolved has actually been one of the things I've enjoyed, um, and the fact that we as a business have so much potential. We, have, we only have less than 2% of our end market in the geographies we operate in, so we view it as like there's a huge amount of running room. That, to me, keeps it super interesting. Um, I think everyone would have a different answer to that, but there's no question that the job evolves dramatically as, as you grow through time, and it even... Um, just evolves as your priorities are changing. Because sometimes a priority is something where you're like, hey, you know, I need to personally get involved and help make that happen. Sometimes the priority is like, oh, we got to make sure the team just stays focused on these things that seem boring but will move the needle. Sometimes the priorities are like, hey, we've got a problem. We don't know the answer yet. We've got to figure it out. So um, I do think there's a nature of that. But then I think the whole kind of, uh, you know, how, how do you organize activities in the company? How do you define priorities? How do you track and measure success, just the mechanisms for that do change as well. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you're here at one of the great technology universities of the world, so obviously we have to talk about technology. And so um, as you know, the 22 years have, have gone by, I'm sure there have been technological innovations that have been adopted by the company that have propelled you to success. What are a couple of those along the way that were meaningful to you and to your customers? I mean, so there's been quite a few. Um, so, you know, the background we had as engineers, and the background we had from our first business, um, which, which between the time we were running it and then a couple of years after we sold it to another company that stayed there, which was basically like six of the seven years uh, prior, since college, prior to starting um, what's Wayfair, um, was basically in building internet applications for other companies. So we saw a breadth of what was out there. And so we started off by building kind of a custom system for everything we did. What ended up happening is some of the challenges we had when we said we want to have a really big catalog, but it's in this category that's very visual and, and you know, hard to navigate because it's not branded. People don't, you know, as you say, you want a TV stand, great. Now I say, well, what kind do you want? You're like, I, I don't even know. I, what, what's out there? What are, what are my options? What, what do I need to think about? What, how do, you know, what, what do the price ranges look like? What, you know, and then there's the aesthetic piece. There's a the feature function piece. There's the price kind of value piece. Um, and so just how do you manage that size catalog? How do you make it navigable? Um, we came out with one of the first filtered searches. And while there were some filtered search companies that were out there, they generally weren't handling the, si handling the size catalog we had. So there's things we had to do early on like that. Over time, you know, 3D models and generating imagery from 3D models, rendering that imagery to really high quality state. Because again, our catalog's very visual. So how do you, how do you make it navigable? So there's kind of innovations on, 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 on that front. There's a lot we did around how you do retail pricing. And you know, most categories, retail pricing is for items which are very comparable from one place to the next. So your number one piece of information you care about is, well, what price is everyone else at? 
and then I decide what price I'm at. And so you crawl you know, the, the web, you scrape the prices, you, you use that to basically decide your pricing. We do that, but to us, the bulk of our catalog is stuff which is non-branded. And so here, you would need to, there was a lot of innovation around how do you do fuzzy matches of similar but not exact match things? How do you use the price elasticity curve, which is changes by price tranche of the catalog and different classes of goods to determine the right price? Um, because the biggest uh, factors that would impede us on price is not so much that someone get the same exact item somewhere else for a different price. It would be that its price relative to other things either creates substitution, which could either help us or hurt us, or away from us, which of course hurts us the most. So th there's, these, there's a long list of things that we built over time, but we, we have a team of you know, about 2,000 people in the yeah. technology organization. It's a large team organized around all these different areas, and we feel like we get significant benefits through the fact that we're rooted in building technology, not simply in using technology that others have built. We, we do both, but yeah. You know. so, sounds like you're bordering on dynamic pricing. Can I just ask, can I get most favored nation pricing going forward, please? No, thank you. Uh, well, you can, you have my email address. There you email. go. Um, you're at the home of AI. Herb Simon and Alan Newell were amongst the folks that uh, pioneered artificial intelligence back in the 1950s, believe it or not. Uh, right in the basement of the business school here at, at that, what was called Jet, uh, Graduate School of Industrial Administration. So uh, we care about AI a lot, and there's a lot of people here that are working on AI startups or looking to get AI jobs. Um, one of the questions that came from our co-host was, how do you use AI in optimizing your supply chain and your inventory management and your logistics and delivery? Yeah, great. So, so it's an interesting um, challenge for us because... I mentioned that big catalog, and I mentioned it's non-branded. So one of the things our suppliers um, ask us for demand forecast because they own the inventory, but they understand if they get an item that's selling well, the biggest thing they can do that hurts their business is if they run out of stock. Because if they run out of stock, a competitive item is going to start selling, and that item may then lock up that position with the momentum it builds. And then when they come back in stock, they may lose that position. So they, they want to harness all that. On the other hand, the biggest challenge in their business and managing the finances of their business is to make sure they don't have excess inventory. Because too much inventory, they have their cash tied up in inventory that's not moving, and maybe someone's come up with items similar at a lower price, and now they're stuck with that inventory, or maybe they got to mark it down to where they're losing money. And so that, that's a real challenge. So, um, so our, um, the way we use AI in kind of supply chain pricing, delivering logistics is, is in a number of ways. So the first, it starts with like that demand forecasting and basically trying to give suppliers forecasts that take into account substitution, the trends in substitution, and what we view as happening through the catalog, which is a real challenge given that the size of the catalog and the changes that are constantly being made because our suppliers have the ability to make those changes. So we're not controlling that outcome, but yet we're using all the data we have to try to help them. Then there's the kind of question about these items are big and bulky. Over 80%, 85% plus actually are made outside the United States, for example, for the U.S. market. Right. Same for the, for, for the market in Canada. So just to focus on North America for now, most of that's coming in from Asia, some of that's coming in from Brazil, some of that's coming from India, Turkey, other places. Well, there's basically a multi-month period between the time that item is made and it's positioned. Um, so there's that forecasting piece, but then there's the transportation logistics cost. Customers want fast delivery. If you look at the total cost of logistics in the chain, it's about 20 cents of every dollar. So it's a huge uh, piece of the costs. So that revenue dollar, 20 cents being tied up in logistics seems very high. Well, why? The item's big and bulky, and it doesn't cost that much. So the dollar value per cubic foot is just not that high. And so how do you offer fast delivery on something like that? You can't really express that item, and you have a lot of costs tied up already. Well, the answer is really simple. If you move it from the origin to a region that's very close to the end customer, what you do is you're basically speeding up delivery because that last mile delivery leg is sm short, but you're also dramatically reducing cost because that last mile delivery leg ends up being the bulk of the cost, even though you'd say, well, that, geez, why does that make sense? Well, it's just, it's the one that has the least density, it's the least efficient, so the nature is it has the most cost. So there, the, the other thing we do is that we have a relatively complex system around how we forward position goods. So suppliers will, um, for the better selling items, tender us the inventory. We have facilities, break bulk facilities overseas, where these items get broken up into different containers that we have going to different 
fulfillment centers we have in different regions. That's all AI driven. And then, of course, how do we then handle the transportation logistics? Who do we tender it to? How do we move it? Um, and then we're building out our own transportation network. And so a lot of the, the dynamic modeling of that um, right. you know, sits at sort of this intersection of you know, OR, AI, depending on how you want to think about it. So, right. so there's kind of like a whole series of things through that whole chain. And we've now gotten big enough. We operate our own uh, fleet of delivery uh, vehicles. We operate... Uh, forward position delivery centers. We have over 40 of them in the United States, uh, separate from the large fulfillment centers. And then we have a whole variety of third-party carriers where we'll use in the right, right situation. So yeah. managing all of that to uh, optimize for speed, uh, trade off with cost, trade off with quality and damage rates yeah. is, is, is also another place where the AI makes decisions. Well, wow. massive scale, highly complex. I bet you could hire a few experts out of the audience here today. So not, not that I'm pushing it. We would like uh, to do that. Absolutely, absolutely. So let's flip it. That was the back office. What about the front office? There's lots of trends of, of personalization yep. going on. How are you guys staying on the forefront of technology in front of your customers? So obviously, I, we're doing all the things you would expect. You know, How do you help make customer service inquiry responses faster and more accurate? How do you make, you know, generate, um, you know, the, the merchandising content for items? How do you, you know, decide the sort order for items on a personalized basis based on what someone's uh, browsing and purchase history implies that they'll be more or less interested in? So we're doing all that. I'd say where the real opportunity ahead of us is, is how do you actually make that shopping experience increasingly personalized, taking advantage of sort of the, the generative aspect of AI, where, you know, I talk about how the visual imagery and, and the, the emotive nature of the catalog makes the browsing and shopping uh, more complicated. Well, how can we take everything we know about the customer and then everything we know about the catalog and all the, all the uh, traits of items and the, the, the patterns of different people and start creating a much more immersive visual shopping experience that really makes it easier and more enjoyable for someone to shop, right. where they're seeing perhaps their own space finished with the combination of the items they have and new items and helping them find that item that they're looking for in a way that's a lot easier than having to like look at different items and then picture it in their own space. Right. Um, and so that, that's where a lot of a kind of a, what you, maybe what you call R&D is, is focused. Yeah. Can, you, can you measure that in terms of less abandoned carts or more per, per purchase, you know, the higher, higher dollar volume per purchase? So typically, in the things that we've launched so far, the success metric is that it does drive up the session conversions so or the customer's conversion rate overall. And, you know, that then what you find is that has a correlation to repeat behavior over time, customer lifetime value. So that's what you're measuring for. And I think what we've done so far is we've had some advances we've been able to roll out. And then we have a bunch of areas where I wouldn't say we've cracked it yet, but we are, we're actively working on things that we think will work. And Great. as we figure them out, we'll roll them out. CEOs make tough decisions, and, and Wayfair has recently made a, a tough decision regarding its workforce. And you have a lot of future leaders here in the audience, uh, and uh, they, they want to sort of understand how, how do you approach these situations? You know, what is the process? What is the mindset? And how do you ultimately make those decisions? Yeah, so um, the, the Wayfair-specific challenge is that basically during, you know, the kind of what, what I'd call the early COVID era, but basically particularly t end of 2020 and 2021, where our demand had exploded, we got to a point where we really started aggressively hiring to try to catch up to that demand and do all the things we wanted to do. And at the time, also, you know, financing capital was very inexpensive, and so there was no real monetary limits on it. And w we made a mistake. We ended up overhiring to a fairly dramatic degree. By the summer of 22, what we had realized is not only had we done that to where the cost structure was too high, but we're also, we're just not getting things done at all at the speed that you would expect, which is like a weird conundrum that the team could grow so much and yet you're getting things done, you know, more slowly. Well, we tried to tackle that by, you know, reducing the team size and that made things go faster, but we we're still finding a lot of the same problems. We, we further reduced the team size and basically the same problems. And what we realized is that our core problem, because at that point we'd gotten to where we were profitable, our core problem was not actually the cost side of it. It was actually that we had lost touch with sort of the organizing principles we'd always built the company on. And what size team should you have? Hey, these three areas are interrelated. They should be under one leader so that there's not a lot of time spent coordinating decision making and meeting to debate what to do. 
Um, and so what we did is, and what you're referring to is this uh, last month in, in January, or I guess two months ago now, it's now, is it March? No, almost. It's still February. <laughs> All right. Last month. Um, we, um, we actually finished an exercise where we actually redesigned the company. We said, what, what should it be organized like? And then we basically filled in all the boxes with names afterwards. And what we realized is that even though we have a really talented, bright team, iterating our way back to the ideal structure, because you have all these great people, you like them a lot, they're talented, you actually don't iterate your way back. So the first mistake we made was letting ourselves get far away from where we had been for so long, which worked so well. The second mistake we made was not getting just right back to there using the, kind of the first principles approach. And so as we did do it um, that way, we feel like we did get to a very good outcome. Our team, you know, it's really traumatic because our team is like very close with one another and really talented people. The flip side of that is we're seeing all the folks land really good job opportunities very quickly. And so the folks we let go. So it's kind of, it's, that part is, is working out, but it allowed us to get back to a place where we actually feel like we're back to firing on all cylinders. So sure. that's been the good news. That's awesome. Uh, the best interviewer in the house is not here. It's these guys out here. So after one more question, we're going to open it up to questions from the audience. Uh, but uh, before we do that, we've talked a lot about Wayfair. Let's talk about you. What floats your boat? What makes you happy outside of Wayfair? Yeah, so, well, my wife and I, we live in Boston. We have two kids, so spending time together is something we love to do. Um, they're, you know... They're different things, you know, from downhill skiing and pickleball to just reading a book. So there's like a wide variety of interests. Um, What's pickleball? No, just kidding. Just kidding. I, yeah, it's it's amazing how fast it's risen from being uh, effectively not known to becoming right. fairly popular. But it, it, you know, what I've loved about it is like you can get a whole group of people playing, and so, including folks who've never played before. They pick it up very quickly. You can, you know, all ages. It kind of yeah. works out well. It's a very few. Uh, sports work out like that, I think. Very but um, no, so just I have a variety of interests. There's no one dominant thing there either. Great. Well, that's good. You're a, you're a Renaissance man. So let's open it up to the audience for questions. Who would like to ask Niraj the first question? There we go. You're, you got a microphone coming to you. So, hi, I'm Yatharth, first year Tepper MBA. Um, with their, we look at a lot of companies within five to 10 years of growth, but where exactly do you see Wayfair within the next 25 years? Yep. So we believe that, you know, home, we, we believe there's only certain categories that are kind of different from most other categories, meaning that if you're buying dish soap or you're buying paper towels or you're buying a TV, they're kind of all the same. They're branded. You, you either know what you want, you do it, or you use reviews to pick one, and then a lot of these are replenishment type items, and you just kind of do that over and over again. There's a couple categories, though, which are pretty unique because they're quite personal. One is home, and the other is fashion, where you want to find just the perfect item for you. You don't want the same items as everyone else. You know, you take a lot of care in what those items are. Um, and then there's a third category that I think is quite different, but that's for more uh, technical reasons, but that's like automobiles. But most categories are not different. And so in home, we have less than 2% market share if you look at our position in North America and Europe. And we think we're building something that's bespoke for home. So how do you find those perfect items you want? How do you get comfort in what they are? How's the delivery and logistics really easy? All the services you might need, assembly and financing. How do we make it fun and enjoyable? How do we, you know, there's a lot we think we can do to make the vision of this category that a lot of people just read blogs or magazines about because they love the category so much come to life. And we think through that, obviously, we can grow dramatically from having less than 2% market share to having a lot more. So... The way we look at it is like that's our opportunity and our competitors, our biggest competitors, treat it as just another category. Not because they don't know that it's different, but because that is really the appropriate thing for them to get their version of low-hanging fruit. Because they're in all these other categories. And it, you can't make each category's shopping experience be different than the next one. You know, you only have so much space on your app or on what, what have you. And so ultimately, you need to figure out what you're good at. And you know, Home Depot primarily sells building materials, you know, and Amazon sells generalist items and so on and so forth. Well, we can be the home specialist. And through that and through becoming vertically integrated around all these things while powered with proprietary technology, we can provide that experience to customers in a way that, you know, others just are not in a position to. Great. In the spirit of pickleball, we're going to go across the net here to this side. Anybody on this side have a question? 
My family, by the way, get a kick out of you calling me a renaissance man because they, <laughs> they find me to be relatively narrow with very few hobbies. <laughs> Thank you, sir, for coming. I'm second year, James. Um, questions that I wanted to ask is how could you elaborate a little bit about the moment that first investor kind of pitch that you are prepared, and then how did you convince the investor saying this model worked because shipping bulky islands back in 20 years is pretty costly, and then how did you go through that, prepare for that event? Thank you. Yeah, so one thing you know we didn't mention, but one thing we did do is when we started in 2002, we initially bootstrapped the business. And so Steve and I, this is, as I mentioned, the third business we started we, we hadn't made a tremendous amount of money, but we had made enough money in our first business. Our second one didn't really work out, but in our first business, that we, did, we could go without a salary for a little while. So that kind of gave us the latitude to bootstrap it. We bootstrapped it, and we were able to figure out how to get it going. And then we just what we did from there is we grew it out of cash flow. We were able to pay ourselves a salary that was enough for us to you know, live on. And we were relatively young at the time. We had limited costs, so we were, you know, kind of kept things lean. And we basically, we ended up bootstrapping it for a decade. So we bootstrapped it until it had 500 million in sales. The reason we raised money, you know, I guess nine years in 2011, was because we had this view that we could build a household brand. So that we had the idea of Wayfair. We had started by building independent websites for every category. And so when we got to the point of saying, hey, we want to put it all under one, one site, Wayfair, we want Wayfair to become a household name, we didn't, the, the, the cash flow nature of the business, the profitability of it wasn't high enough for us to believe that we could do that just through internally generated funds. But we thought the upside was really high. So it was a weird pitch because we were basically pitching, it was sort of like a, it was a venture bet, right? We're going to create this brand. We don't have one. We're going to do all this. Um, but at like a growth equity stage. And so the growth equity folks, you know, they really want something that's predictable and proven and they're giving you money not with associated in their mind with a lot of risk, maybe to ramp the sales force or something very straightforward. Uh, but for the venture guys, it was like too big a business, too far along. The check sizes they typically would write wouldn't be the type of round you wanted to raise. So the, so the pitch was an unusual pitch. It was like, hey, you know, we have this advantage in terms of understanding this category and the operations and logistics. And oh, but you know, what we want to do is build a household brand. We think that unlocks this much bigger opportunity. So we ended up finding a few groups of folks, uh, Spark, Battery, Great Hill, Harbor Vest, who together did the round, um, each writing what was a meaningful check for them. And that, um, you know, and, and that's sort of uh, how we did it. So long story short, no matter what stage you're at, you still, there's always an element of pitching and selling the vision. What you got to just think about is for the investor, what is the, you know, what is it that will excite them? And then what is the worry they're trying, what, what are the risks that they want to believe are de-risked? In order for them to have confidence that this is a, something worth betting on, you know. Important lesson: the best financing for your startup is your customers buying your product. Absolutely. Someone on this side. Hi, Niraj. Thank you for coming. Two-part question on AI: How important in your organization is explainability with AI? And then, secondly, is there any capability? you would like to integrate AI with, but the technology just isn't quite there yet? Um, so, well, I think explainability only matters in the sense that for you to use AI with a way that you're not reviewing things, you need to have high confidence in what it's doing. And so, like, for example, we... We have, um, we have a few thousand customer service agents, and they, they take phone calls, but they also take emails and chats. One of the things we have running is on emails. We'll take in the email. We have AI agents will create the response, but we still have a customer service agent look at, they see the inbound, they look at the response, they can edit it or change it and send it off. Well, we, we score. The responses have higher quality than the agents just doing the response from scratch using templates. But we still have them look at it. You say, why do you have them look at it? You know, why not? It'll be less expensive, just send it back. Well, we, we, we still, we don't, we, we don't yet have certainty enough that the, the, that that would not create what could be a very small number, but potentially a very bad outcomes. So that's where, like, so when I think about explainability, that's kind of, kind of the impact I think about from it and why that would be very helpful, right? Um, in terms of areas of our business we want to incorporate it with that we haven't done yet, there's definitely numerous. I'd say the easiest one to get your head around is this idea of 
how do we ingest, you know, your, your camera roll or video and or video of your home, and then you tell us what items you want to replace, and we give you a really immersive way to shop that takes away all the risk in your mind of being able to picture that in your space. Because you're literally seeing the finished product, and you're able to experience it in different ways to where people then have a very firm conviction. I love it. I hate it. Works. Doesn't work. But you know, we're not quite there. But there's things you could do with generative AI that I think could be very impactful in our specific world that we don't yet have working, but we're certainly very cognizant of and tinkering with and excited about. And then I think there's still an endless number of ways we can use AI that maybe are not quite as easy to picture as that, but, but would be impactful. This side? Anybody on this side? There we go. Aditya? Thanks. Thanks, Dave. Uh, thank you, Niraj, for your time. Uh, my question was actually related to the kind of skill sets that you're looking for from uh, people that are more from a business background, so to speak, for a tech company, especially since you're mentioning how AI is going to shape kind of the future of your company. It's kind of a key important factor in the company's overall strategy. Um, I think Carnegie Mellon is trying to basically make the MBA program something that is combining elements of tech and, you know, our slogan is hashtag the intelligent future, right? Which is, yeah, we're trying to basically leverage... <laughs> Oh, we're trying to leverage AI and, you know, getting more technical skills to incorporate that as part of the program so that the people that are coming out of this are better equipped to be in key effective strat strategic positions for companies like Wayfair. How do you see business students leveraging technology as part of their skill set to be more effective uh, leaders at companies like Wayfair? Yeah, so I've kind of been espousing this for a while. I, I think to be a successful business leader, I don't think it requires you to necessarily know how to build the technology, but I do think it requires you to understand how to leverage and use the technology. And to the degree that you're, you know, sort of don't understand how it works or don't know, I think, think about that, I think pursuing getting a certain level of knowledge on it's really critical because to think in the future world that, you know, using large data sets and using technology to help create those outcomes in any business problem it's going to be a role that you're going to you're going to want to do that. And so, you know, if you look at a lot of our leaders around our different functions, you'll see, you know, you know, our so for example, um, we have a, a someone on our senior team. Uh, she runs all the the physical retail stores we're opening. Report up to her. All the teams that do all the curation. So for the stores, for the catalog, for major promotions, reports to her. Um, the promotions platform and our specialty retail brands report to her. Um, so if I told you that her undergraduate degree from Brown is in computer science, then you'd be like, well, that doesn't make sense to me, right? Now, if I describe what she's done throughout her career, she's probably been with us for eight years. She probably has another eight or ten years of experience before that. You could see, you could see how she sort of always has been on the business realm, but she was in management consulting. She ended up in the consumer retail practice at Bain. She, you know, a variety of other things out of personal interests, and then you know, all the roles she had with us. You say, oh, geez, that makes sense. Well, you know, has she ever used her computer science degree directly, per se, while she's been with us? I mean, I, I can't say no definitively, but I, I would say probably not. Does that kind of just some of the, the understanding of how technology can play a role probably help her be successful? I would say yes, and that's just one of dozens of examples where it's not necessarily computer science. You have folks who are, you know, they studied economics, but you look at what they're doing today, you say, well, that doesn't really seem to be the same or some type. I mean, my undergraduate degree is in civil environmental engineering, and I have not really put any of the specialty work of that degree to work at all, right? But it's about problem solving. So I think there's, this, there, there, there's just different things you can use, and I think having some degree of understanding the, how technology works and, and how it can play and how it can be part of the creative process in solving problems, I think is really useful. I don't know, Niraj, you're a pretty civil guy. Uh, how about this side here? It's like the least respected major in engineering is what I get told. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time. So my question is regarding the technologies that are uh, impacting at this moment. So I see major companies, including Meta and Apple, getting into augmented reality and virtual reality. So furniture is also something that people would like to try first and see whether it's suiting well with their room and their office space. So how do you think this is going to impact uh, Wayfair at this moment? And do you see it catching up very soon? And are you ready to do that? Yeah, so when we started um, building 3D models, which goes back, 
you know, I'm going to get the years wrong, but I'd say like eight-ish years ago, you know, plus or minus, you know, we thought one of the main use cases for them would be, you know, augmented and virtual reality. And we even had an app on the phone where you could like, um, you could be seeing your room through your camera and you could insert the object and it would render the object in your space. You know, like most early versions of things, that never really took off, ended up not being, you know, sort of a, a big use case. But what ended up being a big use case is using those models to generate imagery, you know, 2D imagery that we would use to have a lot more images of items and, and you know, uh, you know, not have to do photo studio shoots to generate catalog imagery, which allowed the, us to scale the catalog, you know, a bunch of things like that. Um, now, when I think about, you know, hey, does that mean that that vision was wrong? Definitely not. Quite often, it's just too early. It was too early for the quality to be there. It was too early for the user adoption to be there. I think that's inevitable. Now what I think, though, is it's not just the, it's, it, it's, it's going to be some combination of not just rendering that environment, but how do you make it inviting and enjoyable to kind of travel through it as part of your shopping journey versus it just being a discrete step that you can do as a check? Because I think that's the difference on when I think it'll get huge adoption versus be there for sort of the small percentage of people who are really excited about it. We actually have time for one more question, and it'll be from this side. Um. Hey, Neeraj. Uh, thanks, for uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, is there something that Wayfair is trying to get better at, like, as a company? I'm pretty sure, like, you know, every organization has its flaws. So um, is there something that you're actively trying to instill within the company culture or something as such? So I, I think, you know, so... One of our big keys to success has always been the team we have. So we really we attract really bright people who are, you know, hardworking. They're analytic, quantitative. They, you know, they have a customer orientation. They're very collaborative. They enjoy working with each other. As a result, they have fun together, and that that's always been true. I think um, the so I long story short. I actually don't think we want to change the culture. I think, in fact, we love that culture. I think we let ourselves stray from it a little bit um, during the COVID area when we weren't together in the same space. Everyone was working remote. And when we hired too much and got ourselves too senior on average without having kind of discrete teams of the right size focused on things. So we've gotten ourselves back there, and it's felt very good. I think the culture is not something we want to change. I think the things we want to achieve tend to be you know, things we haven't yet done that we want to go do, and we think the culture and keeping the culture is actually a way we achieve them. And so that, that's kind of the way I would describe it. And I think the hard work we had to do with the culture was basically fixing some mistakes we made back in 2020 and 2021 to get ourselves back to where we were before that that let us succeed so much. And so the good news of that is we're back there already. So now we're back there, and that's really nice to have that problem behind us. But that, what we were really doing was going back to the way we were, not, not looking to change it, per se. One of the items on a lot of people's mind in today's world post-COVID is remote work versus being in the yeah. office. What is the policy at Wayfair and yeah. where, where are you heading? So we have a hybrid policy that we like a lot, but implicit in the hybrid policy is that we really do value time together. And so um, we, um, we, depending on the team you're in, you're either in three or four days a week. And so that's either Tuesday through Thursday or Monday through Thursday. Friday is a day where uh, you know folks are welcome to work remotely if they want, and I would say you know the vast majority do. I, I, t I sometimes go in the office on Fridays uh, often because I find it easier, but you know it's sparsely attended on Fridays, um, and that dynamic has worked I think pretty well. We have a number of offices um, located across the U.S. Um, and, and and Europe, and so different teams are based in different places, but they those teams try to have the the team that's working on a topic in just one or two places. And we do have some remote roles, but they're, again, for specific roles. I mentioned we have a few thousand customer service folks. Those roles are virtual roles, mm -hmm. and, and that allows us to uh, get certain talent in a certain way. But we've figured out how to train up those folks and how to help them be successful in, in that remote setting, not getting together very often at all in person. Um, and then we have very specific roles that are individual contributor roles, typically, that are remote roles. Right. Um, and so we've kind of come to a mix that we think works. Um, we felt like when we were not together, it was impeding our ability to have a strong culture, the whiteboarding sessions and the creativity and the communication and the fast-flowing nature of it 
we're getting impeded. So we're, we're kind of like the hybrid, hybrid culture. Great, thank you. You guessed it, we are at the end of the ceremony, obviously. <laughs> I, wanted, like, I would first like to thank you, Niraj, for your insightful uh, uh, journey that you shared with us. Uh, we really appreciate the opportunity that our students had to learn from that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, to commemorate your time with us today on campus, I want to present you with the WL Mellon Speaker Series plaque that we give to our speakers. So. Thank you, thank you very much. Sure. Um, I have one more comment for you before we close the session. Um, I hope you will save the date for our next WL Mellon Speaker Series on March 26th with Lauren Hobart, President and CEO of Dick's Sporting Goods. Once again, thank you for being here and have a great afternoon. Thank you.